So my cousin Gary, three months later, calls me. And in that conversation, I said, look at Gary, I wanted to know something that stuck in my mind about that visit you paid to me in the hospital. And I was really rude to you and I blew you off. But the thing that stuck out of my mind is the peace and the joy that you had. How, you know, how do you deal with somebody who's rude to you and you have that much happiness and peace? And he started to share the gospel with me and I was open to it. And I said, I want that peace. Uh, this is what I'm missing. So that was on a Saturday night, that conversation. The next day, I gave my life on that conversation to Jesus Christ. The next morning, a doorbell rang and it was Jehovah's Witnesses. And I had no idea anything about Jehovah's Witnesses. And they let them in. And I started to study because I thought here I is, you know, God's good. Except the Lord on a Saturday, he brings these people right to my door on Sunday. So I started to study with them. And I studied with them for 11 months. And the first thing I'd like to tell you about it is during the 11 months, I didn't bring one person to Jesus Christ. And I thank God for that. Um, I was really sold into it. I told my wife, if I ever got in an accident, I, no blood transfusion, I was sold to it. And when I became, when I started studying with the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Lord put a, a compulsion on me. And my compulsion was, no matter where I was, if I saw a magazine, a newspaper, a journal, whatever it was, when this compulsion came over me, I had to have this in my grasp. Uh, I never stole anything, but I knew that I can't leave until I have this. And for 11 months, this continued to go on. And I was never even looked at the material. I would take the material and I'd stick it in my dresser drawer where my clothes were. Well, after 11 months, my wife was really upset because she couldn't put my clothes in the dresser drawer. It was stacked with all this information that I never looked at. And you got to understand all this time I'm studying with the Jehovah's Witnesses. And it got so bad for my wife. She was really, she almost went into a depression. And she told me, she says, uh, you know, I'm very uncomfortable with the Jehovah's Witnesses. I want you to check I want you to talk to somebody else. I don't care if it's a priest or I don't want, I just want you to talk to somebody else. And I told her I would, but I actually lied to her because I had no, I, I had no aspirations of talking to anybody else, but God had a different opinion about that. Now I, I got this route. I'm not going to tell you the story how I got this route, but in Santa Barbara, it's one of the most elite places that you can carry mail. Beautiful place. And it was taking seven years to get your own route in Santa Barbara, California. Um, I took a test as a mail handler to become a, a letter carrier, and I got the job. And I was doing um, what they called um, somebody was sick, you take over the route and so forth. And I only did that for three months, and I became a regular uh, you know, I was part-time flex, but I became a regular and I was able to bid on the route. Now I'm the last one on the totem pole out of like 400 carriers in Santa Barbara. You know, everything is done by seniority. And uh, so this route came up for bid. It was the, probably the second or third best route in all of Santa Barbara. And so I bid on it. And people were laughing at me. Tomorrow, what are you crazy? You're gonna, you know, there's these guys with seniority way above you are already getting. They're gonna bid on it. Well, to make a long story short, the message went out that so and so was gonna bid on this route, and he was gonna bid on it. So they didn't bid on it. And, they, and at the end of the story, nobody bid on the route except for me. And the guy who wanted the route was on vacation. And when he came back, he tried to fight it saying, well, I was on a vacation and the post office told him it was your responsibility to check even if you are on vacation. So I got probably the second or third best route in the complete office after three months of being there where everybody else, seven years. 
And the reason why this story is important because when my wife told me to check on somebody, I was on Bath Street and I was holding some mail for two weeks, but huge house on Bath Street here in Santa Barbara. And I told my supervisor, I'm gonna hold this mail one more day. I'm gonna try it today. And if there's nobody there, I'm gonna send it back. And so I went to this house, it was Saturday morning and now the driveway's full of cars, the street's full of cars, and I, there's people in the house, obviously, because the, the driveway was loaded. So I knocked on the door and the lady comes out and I had all this mail with me. And I said, I'm looking for a person by the name of Greg Meeks. And the lady said, well, that's my husband. We just moved in last night. And I said, but I also have for the same address, Calvary Chapel of Santa Barbara. I said, well, that's my husband. He's a pastor. And I said, well, that's great. I fellowship. And she said, where? And I said, at the Kingdom Hall. And she said, could you wait a second? And she shut the door. Well, soon after that, the pastor comes out to the door and he starts talking to me. He says, you're a Jehovah's Witness? I said, yeah. He goes, you know, I would really like to talk to you about stuff that the Jehovah's Witnesses aren't going to tell you. And I'd like to spend some time with you. And I thought the, the light bulb went off. Hey, you promised your wife that you would talk to somebody and this is your way out. So I said, all right, I'll, I'll do that. Make my wife happy. So he came over to the house. Again, it was a, a Saturday night. He came over and he spent seven hours with us. I think he went home around 12 o'clock. And some of the things that he shared to me had to do with prophecy that was uh, given by the Watchtower Society. They said Jehovah God told them this, so it was supposed to take place. And he showed me that in 1975, Jesus Christ was supposed to be coming back and take rule in Jerusalem. And so I took this information and I started to go over it. And the next Wednesday, I brought this information to my elders at the, at, the, uh, at the Bible study, which was being held at my house at that time. And I asked the question, what about this prophecy that says our leaders are, they prophesy in the name of Jehovah and it didn't come to pass. And they said, though, we don't talk about that. People make mistakes and we just don't question the elders. And he said, Frank, just let it go. It's not going to be helpful to what we're doing. So I stopped. Well, I'm looking at the material the following week, and there's other prophecies. And I kept asking the question the following week. And to make a long story short, I did this about three or four weeks. And it was really bothering me. So Greg Meeks set up a meeting where two of the Help Jesus Ministry guys who are experts in Jehovah's Witnesses, um, and I, I got my elders to a Bible study at my house. And I said, look, it, I want to know some answers. These guys have the original books from our leaders, and they're showing me about these, not just this 1975 prophecy, but the prophecies that came all the way back in the 1800s, the late 1800s. So Ken Dooley, who was my best friend and my elder at the Kingdom Hall, who was leading the Bible studies, he told me, he says, Frank, we told you, stop asking these questions. And you haven't stopped. And he said, you're, he, he went like this, like you're going to cut your throat. And he said, we don't want anything to do with you. We're not going to study with you anymore. You're out. Don't call me. I don't want anything to do with you ever again. And I said, Ken, what, what are you talking about? All I want to know is the truth. You gave me a book that says, make sure of all things. And that's what I'm trying to do. And now when I bring this to you, you say you want to cut my throat, meaning I can't even be your friend anymore. And he said, we warned you, we don't question the elders. And that's what you're doing continuously. He says, that's it. They got up and left. Well, my heart was shattered. I said, I can't believe this. My best, my best friend just did this to me. And I was, you know, I, I thought to myself, man, now what? So I didn't really know what to do, but I called 
Pastor uh, Greg Meeks, the, the pastor who gave me this information, and uh, he said, Frank, you know, I'm sorry that this happened, but this normally happens when people question. And he said, how would you like, we're going to have a, uh, a men's fellowship at Surf Beach. How would you like to come? And I thought, you know, I was really in bad shape then because I was broken hearted that these people who are supposed to be religious people just cut you off like that. And I said, I would go. So we were in a trailer and I remember the, the sermon Greg Meeks was given. One thing stuck out that said about fishers of men. And I hadn't a clue what he was talking about because we studied the Watchtower, the magazines, and we listened to the elders. We never really got into the Bible. When we got into the Bible, our mind was so distorted and, and so manipulated that you'd believe anything that they were saying. And so I asked him, I said, what are you talking about, this fishers of men? And he went over the story with me. And that was the first, that was the first moment in my life. I said, holy mackerel, this, this is really cool. So I can't tell you how long, it may have been a week or two weeks after that, I was, uh, I was sleeping and I had a vision. And in this vision, Jesus Christ came to me in the vision. I didn't see his face, you know, in, in this vision. I just knew somehow this was Jesus. And he gave me instructions and he said, get up, go to your dresser drawers, take everything out of the dresser drawers and go and bring this to the kitchen table. I'm going to meet you. And I woke up and I thought, look, am I, am I still dreaming or is this, is this reality? And uh, I said, I've never had a dream like this so real before. So I'm leaning on the, on the backboard of the, of the bed, just thinking about it, contemplating, oh my gosh, I've never had anything like this happen to me. And uh, as I'm, I'm just sitting there, this voice starts to speak to me in my bedroom. It's, it's really tough for me to get this out. And he started to tell me the same thing that I just dreamt about. Get up, go to the dresser drawers, bring everything to the kitchen table. And, uh, I, you know, when I heard this, I started to shake because my wife said, you know, when she told me I want you to go and talk to somebody, she thought maybe I was having a nervous breakdown. And when I started to hear this voice in the room, I wasn't sure in my dreaming Am I awake? I don't know, but I, I just know that somebody's talking to me in this room, giving me these instructions. And so I'm shaking, and he repeated it over and over again. I said, okay, okay. And I got up, and he put my wife to sleep because she's a very light sleeper, just like um, the guards went to sleep so Paul can get out of prison. And uh, so I, I made all kinds of noise, bringing all of this material that I had saved and never looked at. And I went to the kitchen table and a huge pile. And I'm, I'm sitting there shaking. And, and the Lord spoke to me and said, look down on the table. And he gave me a scripture. And I remember that one of the first scriptures that he gave to me was Ezekiel chapter 37. Um, about Israel becoming a nation again and what was going to happen to Israel in the last days. And he said, look down because I've given you this information. So I, I really don't know how the Lord manipulated the pile, but when I looked down, one of my compulsions, I was at a swap meet and they had these racks and all I saw was the, the top of it, it was red. When I saw that red, the compulsion came over me and I took it, but I never read the magazine. When I picked this magazine to look at it, it was dated 1948. And the whole magazine, the Life magazine, which I still have, was the story of how Israel was born again as a nation. And Jesus said, mark it in your Bible. Now, my cousin Gary sent me a King James Bible that it was brand new. I never even read it because I was reading the Jehovah's Witness stuff. 
And so I got the, the King James Bible and he said, mark it. So I put it in where Ezekiel 37 was and he gave me another scripture. And then he gave me another scripture and the, he told me, look on the table, it's there. So to make a long story short, after about six or seven of these instructions, I stopped shaking and I cannot begin to express the joy of being with Jesus. He's talking to me, God, he's talking to me. So I just stopped shaking. I was so excited. I just couldn't believe this was happening. And to me, I, three hours passed. And after the three hours, every single thing that I had a compulsion to take home was fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I broke the binding on my Bible because it was, you know, the, I was sticking a lot of these magazines in there and clips from newspapers and stuff. I broke the, bi the binding of the Bible, brand new Bible. It's still broken to this day. And the Lord said, I'm going to give you instructions. He says, you're going, I want you to do a slideshow of the things that I've given to you. And he was very specific about the slides. And you'll understand why. And he said, I want you to put everything that I've given to you in the slideshow and start showing it. And I thought to myself, I don't know, I don't know how to put a multimedia slideshow together. Yeah, I didn't even have a camera. And uh, so I didn't have any really any of the equipment to do anything like this. And I didn't have any idea how to do it. But the Lord said, he told me, he said, when you do this, I am going to have people that are standing by so that when you get to the point where you need the help, they're already going to be there. And I listened to that and he said, what you're going to do is you're going to talk to people like you normally talk to people. I want you to keep your pride in check. And I wouldn't understand that until later on. He said, I want you, you don't have to dress up in the white clothes and start yelling and screaming and dancing on the stage. You're not going to do that. And you're never going to charge anybody for anything that you do in this ministry. I will do it for you. So I, I listened to what he had to say. And uh, I took everything into my heart. And uh, I asked I asked the Lord, I said, okay, Lord, I don't know what the heck I'm doing, but I, you know, if you're being visiting me for three hours, I know something good is going to come of this. So the next Sunday, I went to Calvary Chapel because I started to go to Calvary Chapel where the, where the uh, Greg Meeks, where I gave my life over to, uh, to the Lord because of that intervention by Greg Meeks. And in the Sunday service, there was a girl, we were at the YMCA, and this girl came after the service, and we were talking, and this girl from the uh, Calvary Chapel, she said, I was just up to get a drink of water, and I started talking to this young guy up there, and he said that he was from Rochester, New York. Aren't you from Rochester? And I said, yes. He goes, you, you may even know him. I'm going to go up and see, get him. So she went up and got him, and I have my wife standing next to me. Where he, there was a little crowd there, and my wife was standing right next to me, and they brought him down, and his name was Steve Cangelosi. And it turned out that he lived right around the corner from my, my wife, or at the time it was my girlfriend. But I didn't know anybody that he knew. All I knew was that, you know, he was very close. And uh, I asked him, I said, what are you doing here? He goes, well... I've been traveling across the country. I just graduated from college and I was looking for a place to live. Last night I was in Los Angeles. I hated that place. So I came to Santa Barbara to, to take a shower because he was living out of his van. And he said, I noticed that, you know, they were having a church service and I had to wait for the church service to end so I can start working out, take a shower. 
And he says, when I was waiting, just before I got here, I was driving around Santa Barbara and he said, I want to make Santa Barbara my home. Now, when he's talking to me, Jesus, the same voice, starts to talk to me. And I'm listening to what the conversation is about what Jesus was telling me. And I'm talking to Steve at the same time. And Jesus told me, gave me specific information. He says, you're going to take him home and you're not going to take no for an answer. So I said, Steve, what are you going to do? And he says, well, I'm going to just try to work it out, try to find a job. And I told him, I said, well, guess what? You're going to come home with us. And he goes, what? And my wife, who was standing next to me, she ribs me in the side. Like, you don't even know this guy and you're going to bring him into our house? And uh, But I took no for an answer and he came home with us. And right away, he got a job working on the fishing boat in Santa Barbara. And the, I think it was the day or two days after he started to live with us, my wife got a phone call from her mother. She had a double surgery on her feet. So she had to rush home, take the kids, and go to New York to take care of her, her uh, mom. Well, the first thing that I did before they left is I showed I had... I had uh, gotten some slides from a guy in the uh, uh, Calvary Chapel because I knew I had to start this. And that somebody showed me that there was a guy in Calvary Chapel and I asked him if he could take some slides of these scriptures and the documents that I had. And so he did that. The first layout was he took the, the uh, information. It was on a the asphalt, the street asphalt, and he gave me these slides and I put them in one carousel. And uh, I showed that carousel. The beginning was the scripture and then the following was the fulfillment of it. It was very small, short. And I showed it to him and he didn't say anything. Well, a couple of days later, after my left, my wife took off to go to New York, Steve says, I want you to come outside. Uh, excuse me, I want to show you something. So he goes out, he's got this big white van with sliding door. He opens the sliding door. He said, I didn't tell you where I graduated from. I said, well, where'd you graduate? He says, Rochester Institute of Technology and Photography. I'm a professional photographer. And he said, look what's in here. He says, this is all my photography stuff. And he says, you know that slideshow you showed me? And I said, yeah. He goes, I'm a professional. You haven't charged me for anything. I want to do this for you for free. And when he said that to me, I started crying, literally. And he said, what did I say wrong? What? And I said, Steve, you don't have a clue. Because before that Sunday, when I went to church, um, one of the part of the story I left out is I got sick again. And people were coming to the hospital from Calvary Chapel, and they were helping my wife. And uh, because of that, when I was, I drove home with the pastor and I told the pastor, I want to be, I want to pray um, for one person to help me. And, or I wanted to help one person because all these people were helping my wife. And it was before when I asked him, I told the pastor what happened to me in the visions, because I was afraid to tell anybody about it. But when I was driving around with the pastor, I told him about what I'm telling you about. And he says, oh, my God, Frank, I mean, it's obvious that God has set you in this ministry. you got to do a good job. And it was then when I told him, I don't have a camera. I don't have any equipment. I don't have anything. And then little by little, this is what the Lord did. So when, when he told me that he wanted to do this, I remember when the Lord said, when you get to the point, somebody is going to be there. I'll have them there already, and this is what we did. So he says, all you do is you get everything arranged, what you want me to, to photo you know, the photography, and I will do that. And it took one month. And uh, I think the 31st day, my wife came back with the kids in the slideshow, in the carousel, two carousels, was finished. And what happened, I showed this. I told Pastor Greg Meeks that I had this. I only had, at the time that I first showed him, there was one carousel, 
And I, when I told him about what the Lord had given to me, he said, I want you to show this on Sunday night. And that blew me away. And I, I said, you, don't you want to see it? He said, no, I really believe that Jesus gave this to you. Show it tonight at church. And I, so I got this one carousel. I borrowed the projector. And for a half an hour, I, it was my first teaching. And I showed him the scripture and then the fulfillment of it. But after the month was over with, with uh, Steve Cangelosi, it was the beginning of a professional slideshow. And right after I showed that to the church at Santa Barbara, that first showing, 31 days later, I got a phone call from somebody who had just happened to be at the showing at the Santa Barbara with the first showing. And she said, I talked to my pastor, I told him what you had, and he wants you to have the presentation at his church. And I thought to myself, hey, I'm all yours. This is, you know, this is what the Lord said. And when that happened, every, the ministry started to blow up. I, I started to preach all over the place. I was being called uh, to hotels. Um, I was brought to uh, TV shows. I was brought to online a radio show out of Santa Maria almost on a weekly basis. Um, I was the Lord was opening doors to me, and as the doors were opening, my slideshow was getting bigger and bigger. It was becoming more professional. And every place that I, you know, that I went, that I knew that, that I was, I wanted to go to. For example. Um, the libero theater in Santa Barbara holds a thousand people and little by little, if I told you everything, it, I could write a, a book. It would be like war and peace, what the Lord did. But in this, in the, in the scope of the, the little steps that the Lord brought me to, he ended up bringing me to libero theater one day back then it was only $300. And that was a lot of money for like five hours at the libero theater which is one of the nicest theaters in santa barbara and i i prayed and i said all right lord i don't have three hundred dollars i got the family and it's hard for us to live and so we prayed for it and the next morning when i went to open the door to go to work there was three brand new hundred dollar bills attached to my door and I, you know, I just took that money, I didn't know where it came from. And I went to Libero Theater and I put the down payment or the pay for the, the time for the Libero Theater. And the Libero Theater was packed. And you have to understand at this time now, I have a real to real sound effects. One of the first shows that I showed at the Libero Theater a guy came up after that show, the first show, because I showed it twice at the Libero Theater. The first time I showed it, a guy came up and said, your presentation was fantastic, but there's only one thing wrong with it. And he says, your voice shouldn't be on me. And I said, you know, it's funny you said that because my wife just brought that up tonight before we left and she wanted to pray about that. Let's pray that the Lord would send you somebody. And you showed up and tell me that. He says, well, I'm a radio disc jockey in Santa Barbara, and I'd like to do this for you. So all you have to do is write the script, and I will produce it for you. And I asked him, how much is it going to cost me? He says, nothing. I want to do this for you. So he brought the professional person to do the voicing of it. So I took out the, the pen and the pencil and I started to write the script and my wife went over the script, you know, she typed everything out and, and it took a while, but we went back to the studios and it took maybe four or five days to put the whole thing together and it was on reel to reel. Now it's starting to look like a motion picture, but only using slides. And one of the girls at Calvary Chapel there's equipment. If I was home, I'd be able to show you everything that I'm, I'm showing you here. And the, what's really good about this ministry is everything that the Lord did. I have eyewitnesses who were there with me that can tell you their end of the story. But this girl uh, had a, a 
a multimedia transporter where it's a box and it will move the slides at different speeds, fade in and fade out. And she said, I'll let you borrow it. And so we went to Libero Theater. I used it the first presentation. And then I started to use that presentation when I started to go out in different places. And the second time, the, the night before I was to go on the Libero Theater again, the girl called me. Now months have already passed. And she called and said, Frank, I'm moving to Texas and I need to get my dissolve unit back from you. And I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? You know, this tomorrow I have a show and I'm not going to have a dissolve unit and I don't have six, $700, how much they cost. What am I going to do? So she said, well, I'm going to come over around six, seven o'clock. I got to pick it up. Well, I got, I put it in the box waiting and not knowing what I was going to do the following day. She comes over and she said, Frank, I need to tell you something. After I spoke with you, I wrestled with Jesus. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, I wrestled with the Lord about this equipment. I know that I needed this equipment, but Jesus told me, you are not to take the equipment away. Give it to him. And she said, it came to a point where I knew that I couldn't take this from you. So I just wanted to tell you, I'm sorry, because in the beginning, when I asked her after Steve Canzalosi, left to go back to witness to his family back to New York. I asked if she would like to be part of this ministry. And she said, you're not professional enough for me. And that night when she came over and she said, I wanted to apologize to you because what you're doing for the Lord, I'm very sorry that I even said that to you because it's obvious that Jesus is with you. And, you know, there's a lot of tears in this ministry. And that was one of those tears that I, I shed it because it was just phenomenal. I, the Lord was so gracious to me. And I needed a reel to reel because the reel to reel that I borrowed for that second show, they, the, the guy that I borrowed it from, he had to take it back. So I'm delivering mail in Santa Barbara. And every day I walk into the chiropractor's office and Sal Herrera there was the chiropractor. And I had a register or a certified mail that he had assigned for. And when I looked up, I noticed that there was a reel to reel on the shelf. And I told Sal, I says, you know, I've been here almost every day delivering the mail, but it's the first time I've ever seen that reel to reel there. And he goes, well, I just put it out there last night because if what happened is, you know, we do x-rays. And every time I give an x-ray, everything would be erased. So I said, man, you know, I just had to give my, uh, I borrowed one and I got a show tomorrow night and now I'm empty. He goes, take it home, Frank. I said, what do you mean just take it home? He says, well, if you want to give me $100 painting whenever you can. So I walked home. <laughs> I went home and I placed the reel to reel on the desk and Terry said, where'd you get that? And I said, Jesus. <laughs> and so the next night we went to the, we went over and we had the show. I had the reel to reel. I had the dissolve unit. God blessed it. And over and over things, it started to happen. Now, not only am I showing the slideshow, now Jesus is performing miracles. and he was doing things that people thought were unbelievable. And I'm just glad that they were with me. Um, I'll give you some examples of it. I had, when you look at the Lord in the timing, because he's timeless, he knew that he was going to pick me. Um, mm -hmm. when, when I was in the Navy, I went down to, uh, it was in Pensacola, and I'm swimming out in this beach. Here's a Rochester guy in the water swimming out there. There was nobody out there. I must have been about 200 yards out there. And I heard this whistling, screaming, and I turned around, and the people on the beach are going like this, yelling, come in, come in, come in. And I thought, what the heck is going on? So I'm starting to swim, doing the breaststroke like this, back to shore. And when I got out, 
there was an ambulance there, the guy, you know, all kinds of people. And he ran up to me and says, where do you stay? Where do you stay? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you, you mean to tell me you don't sting anywhere? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. No, I don't sting. And he's checking to see if there's any red marks and stuff. And he said, there's nothing. He said, do you understand what happened? He said, we were infested with Portuguese man of wars. There's literally thousands of these fish, jellyfish. Well, if one jellyfish were to, to sting you, you would have died. And here I am swimming. And I'm pushing these massive jellyfishes out of the way. And not once did I get stung. And so the Lord knew that I would be placed in a ministry. And I believe that he just allowed. I should have been stung hundreds of times by the amount of jellyfish that I pushed out of the way. And I wasn't. Now. Family is really important. And when you're growing up and you're trying to show people how to live your life, if, if you're on fire for Jesus, you live your life, things are going to happen that nobody can explain. I took Adam. Uh, well, Adam actually took me. He says, Dad, I want to go fishing. I'm going to take my grandson. Let's go fishing. And uh, it, it'll be a great time. So we went over to the pier. And now this is up in the Bay Area because I went up to visit him. And we went up to the pier about five o'clock in the afternoon. You can ask Adam, he'll tell you the story. And I walked up to the pier and I, there was a radio boombox. And I thought it was a Christian station. So I asked the guy who was fishing to the left of me. I said, is that a Christian station? He said, no, no, man, that's not a Christian station. And I said, well, I thought it was. It sounded like it might have been Christian music. He goes, nope. And I said, well, how are you doing? Just catch anything. And he opened the lid on his container. He's, he's got one fish in there. I said, how long you been here? And he said, all day. And I said, you got one fish? Said, yeah. And said, Jesus spoke to me. He says, I want you to witness to this guy. So I said, what if I told you Jesus sent me over here? And when I throw my fishing line into the water, Jesus is going to put a fish on that line. And he laughed at me. And I said, well, I'm going to throw it in and see what happens. So I threw the line in. And this, I'll, I'll swear, this is exactly how it happened. I put, put that line in the water and the fish bit it right up. And I you know, reeled the fish in like this. And I held it up. I took the fish off and I threw it back. And you know, he looked at me like, yeah, all right. But pretty lucky. And I said, I'm going to do it again. Just to show you that I'm here because of Jesus. I took the line, threw it back in, got another fish. I said, I'm not done. And I kept doing this about six or seven times. Now, unexpectedly, there was, which I did not know, there was a young man who had been listening to what I said. And he came up to me and said, you know, I, I saw and I heard what you, what you were doing, and I want you to teach me about Jesus Christ. I thought that I was supposed to witness to that guy, but it, it wasn't him. It was somebody else who came up to me because of the word that I was in the, in the faith that I was projecting about Jesus Christ. So Adam took him aside, and he started talking to him about the Lord. There was another case with Adam, my son. He said, I got a buddy from Iran, and he's going to, we bought a gun up in Sacramento. He's going to pick it up, and I've been witnessing to him, but he's, it's really not taking. Would you like to come up and speak to him? And I said, Adam, you know me, man. When somebody calls, I'll go. So I just got out of the police academy, and I was one of the top shooters in the police academy, and I said, yeah, I'll go, and I'll show him how to use this weapon. So we went up there, showed him how to use the weapon. After that was all done, we went out to have lunch. And this guy is drinking beers, right? And I told him, I said, you know, you really should kind of cut down because you're driving a car. And he goes, no, I'll be OK. I'll be OK. So we pack all the stuff. The guns are in the back. We've got the ammo in the back and the trunk. And we get on the freeway up there in California. He's driving. And I'm sitting in the back seat right behind the driver, and Jesus Christ speaks to me. 
He says, I want you to tap him on the shoulder. And I want you to tell him this. So I told him, I said, look, at Jesus just spoke to me. And he told me that he's going to do something to you so that you'll understand the message that I gave to you on the way here came from Jesus. And when it happens, you will know that it came from Jesus Christ, not from me. And I said, he said, I need to tell you right away. It's urgent, but I can't tell you how fast it's going to come. He just told me I got to do this right away. So, and I leaned back in the chair and about 15 seconds later, siren blows off, right? Pulls him over. The cop gets out of the highway patrol. He gets out of the car, runs over to the car, you, you know, knocks on the window and he says, give me your license registration. Do you have any idea how fast you're going? Of course, he was driving about 80, 85 miles an hour. And now the kid is, he, he's shaking. And, and I mean, a kid, he's probably in 27, 28 years old at the time. And so he, he reaches into the glove box to get the registration and he's shaking, trying to get his license out. Now he's got beer on his breath. And he's got weapons and ammunition in the back of the car. And he thought, well, maybe I'm going to jail. <laughs> so, you know, as cops, we have the radios right by our side. Here. And as he's handing him his license, the cop gets a call. He listens to it. And the cop yells at him. He says, look at you get back on the road and you do the speed limit, and if I catch you, I am definitely going to bring you to jail. He runs back to the car, puts the sirens on, and takes off. I leaned up, and I tapped this guy on the shoulder, and I said, you know what happened here? Jesus showed you redemption. Number one, he showed it, and he gave you redemption on the cross. That's why I'm here, and he showed you that he can redeem you again, and he just demonstrated because that guy got a call to save you. That's twice. And he was just blown away. Now, Adam, who's sitting in the passenger side, turns around and he said, this happens to my father all the time. And it was just, it was one of those things that are crazy. And then I had pastors calling me, Greg Meeks, um, called me up he, he, when he moved from Santa Barbara. He went up to Buellton. I didn't even know where he had moved to because I hadn't talked to him for two weeks. And I'm sitting down with my with my wife. We were watching television. I was laying on my belly. She was right next to me. We're just watching TV, and I was like this, resting, watching TV. And Jesus spoke to me. He says, "I want you to get up, and I want you to call Greg Meeks right now, and I want you to tell him this message. You have to do it right now." And I thought, I don't even know where Greg moved to. So I did some investigation real quick, phone books, asked people, got the phone number, and I called him and I said, Greg, this is Frank Demora. And he said, Frank, I can't talk right now, uh, but call me back. He said, no, Greg, I need to tell you something. Jesus just spoke to me. And he told me I need to give the, this message to you right now. And this is the message. Jesus wants you to know that he knows that you're right, they're wrong. You will stand and they will fall. And he said, Frank, do you have any idea what's going on? And I said, Greg, I haven't talked to you for two years. He goes, I'm in a meeting right now with the three elders of my church who are trying to split my church. They want to take authority. And I got... Six months, they actually, they split the church. And then six months later, after I talked to, to Greg Meeks, the church that split with those three elders fell apart. And Greg's church is still standing. So what I had told him in that message, the urgent message, it came to fruition. Greg called me in another time and he said, I want you to come. We have somebody who is sick here in our church in, in Buellton. And I want you to come and pray for him. And I said, well, Greg, you got people there. Why don't you call him? He said, because Jesus told me you have to come and pray for him. So I got in the car and I drove over to the house where he was staying. And he was in this in a, a bed, uh, like a hospital bed. And there was a railing. And I, there was a chair right next to him. I sat down in the chair. I met his wife. And I went through the railing. I grabbed his wrist. 
And when I grabbed his wrist or his wrist, Jesus spoke to me and said, this is the message you're supposed to give to his wife. So I immediately, I let go of the wrist and I looked at the wife and I said, what I'm about to tell you, I really don't understand it, but this is, the, this is what he told me. And I'm only going to tell you what he said, because if I say anything other than that, it's coming from me, not from God. Jesus told me that in three days, all of this equipment that's here with your husband is going to be taken out of the house. And that's all I can tell you. Well, make a long story short, um, I left. Three days later, I get a phone call from the guy's wife that I prayed for. And she goes, I, I just want to thank you for coming. You know, it's been three days, Frank. And I said, I know. And she goes, they just took the last parts of the equipment out of my house today. She goes, we had been praying for months that either you heal him or take him home. And what you came in and you, what you told us actually happened. And today my husband died and they took all the equipment out. It's been the third day. So sometimes when the Lord speaks to you, you haven't a clue what's going to happen. It may be good. It may be bad. I was invited to a Bible study. I never been to this Bible study before, but I figured if I'm going there, something's got to be good of it. Listen to the word of the Lord or something's going to happen. So it was a deputy sheriff and his wife. They were holding these Bible studies in the uh, Vandenberg village. I was the first one there and I started to talk to this couple because I never met him before. And they were telling me for seven years, they've been trying to get pregnant and they haven't been pregnant. And I said, well, did anybody pray for you? And they said, we've had all kinds of people pray for us. They laid hands on us. They oil, put the oil on us and nothing has happened. So I told them, I said, I don't care what happened in the past. This is what I'm going to tell you right now. When I pray for you, you will have a baby. So I, I laid my hands on them and I prayed for them. Guess what, folks? got twins twins <laughs> and i you know how am i supposed to know right i mean all i was was to be faithful in what the lord told me to do and they ended up having twins there was a buddy of mine after steve cangelosi left i needed another photographer for the show to keep going on and as the promise with Jesus, there will be somebody else that will take the place. Calvary Chapel, now we're back at the Calvary Chapel at the YMCA. Service is all over with. I'm standing up at the, at the backside of the, the uh, YMCA where we were meeting. And I'm, I'm up there with my wife. And I look down and I see this one guy on the stage. And he had his elbow on the stage, leaning on the stage. And the Lord told me, you have to go down and talk to him right now. So I made my way down and I said, hi, my name is Frank Tamora. And I wanted to tell you something. I was up there and Jesus spoke to me and he said, I need to come down to talk to you. And he says, are you kidding me? And I said, no, this is what he told me. He says, I'm down here praying that Jesus would send me somebody and you come down walking, telling me that Jesus spoke to you saying to come down. <laughs> so I, I said, well, what? I've never seen you before. He says, I just moved here from New Jersey. And so I invited him the same way that I invited Steve Candrelosi. I said, how would you like to have lunch with us? And now my wife is more sympathetic to, you know, cause she's starting to see these things take place. He came over and come to find out that he is a professional photographer for a railroad. He's doing all kinds of photography. So when I showed him what, what was happening, he said, I want to do this for you as the professional to keep the slideshow going. And when I was working as a Jehovah's Witness or witnessing to the Jehovah's Witnesses, John 
became a really good friend of mine. And he knew that I was nonstop going. I was witnessing the Jehovah's Witnesses almost every single day. The Lord put me in a Jehovah's Witnesses so that he could bring me back to the Jehovah's Witnesses that I can take the Jehovah's Witnesses out of the kingdom hall. And because he, he filled me with the knowledge of what they were teaching, and now I had the truth so I can combat put the armor on to fight against what they were doing, the false doctrines that they were proclaiming. So I was doing this for months. And finally, John goes, Frank, he says, you need a break. You won't take it, but I want to, I want to demand you take a break. And this is what we're going to do. And my, my wife loved him for this. Says, we're going to go up into the mountain in Santa Barbara. It's the top the highest mountain in Santa Barbara. We're going to walk, hike up the mountain at night. It's great. So I said, all right, John, I gave it to him. I said, let's go. So we, we started the trek at eight o'clock. There's a full moon. We didn't have a flashlight or nothing. All we had was the full moon. And if I called John Roskowski on the phone right now to tell, ask him to give you the story, he, he'd tell you what I'm telling you right now. We started walking up the hill or this mountain and about a half an hour into the, into the walk, Jesus spoke to me and I bowed down to listen to what he was saying. So I told, I stopped and John goes, what are you doing? I says, one second, Jesus is talking to me. And he goes, what? And I said, yeah, Jesus is speaking to me. And John, he told me that we're going to witness to somebody who's coming down this mountain. He said, Frank, I come up here all the time. There's, I'm telling you, there's nobody up here. Nobody's up here at this time and night. And I says, all I know is this is what he told me. So let's take it at that. So we're, we started to walk up the mountain. About 15 minutes later, you see a, a light coming down, and we lost the light because whoever was up there was traversing the mountain, and then the light would shine up. We'd lose him, and so as we were walking up and he was coming down, I walked up. This guy came up, and he had a backpack on, on him, and he goes, John now goes, oh, my God, really, there's somebody up there. He goes, Frank, you know, when the guy started to walk to us, he says, Frank, let me do this. Let me witness to him. I says, go ahead, John. So I asked the guy, first of all, I said, how are you doing? And he went into a, a, a rant saying, I, I hate this city. I hate being down here. I was up at the top looking. He says, I don't, I didn't even want to come down. The life is miserable. And he went off. John gets on his knee, one knee. And he's like this on his one knee. And he looks at the guy and he says, let me tell you about the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he starts witnessing to him. And the guy, it was just like in the Bible where they came to get Jesus with the lanterns when Jesus said, I am he, and they, they went back. That's what happened to this guy. And Jesus, and he's going off on <laughs> witnessing to him. And after he was done, the guy left, and we, we started going up into this mountain just screaming the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, praising Jesus with all our hearts. We're walking up into the mountain, and about 10 minutes later, Jesus stopped me. There was two big boulders on his path, and the, and the moonlight was shining right on it. I mean, it was almost better than a flashlight. And Jesus, I'm listening to the Lord, and I couldn't even believe what I heard. And John goes, now what? He goes, John, you won't believe this. But Jesus just told me, we are going to witness to Russians who are coming down this mountain. He said, are you not... I, you know, the guy coming down, but Russians coming down the mountain, Frank, I said, John, this is what he told me. So we're walking up into the mountain and we heard, it sounded like a little kid laughing. And I said, John, there's somebody up there. And he goes, yeah, it sounds like, it sounds like a little kid. So we're making our way up and who's ever up there is making our way down. And it got to a place where there was a, a wide opening. And I told John, let's wait, because I don't want to scare him. And there, when they finally came out, there was a little guy on the shoulder of one of these guys. And then there was another guy beside him. And they walked up and I said, well, how are you doing, guys? And they, they said, well, we're doing great. And I said, can I ask you a question? Because as they were coming down, they're... We didn't understand what they were saying. I said, could you tell me where you're from? He said, now this is a while back. He said, we just escaped from Russia. And John just about lost 
his pee, man. He just about peed his pants when he heard that. And we started the conversation about how they how they got out. And one of the guys said that he was thinking about becoming a pastor here in the United States. And I point blankly told him about how the Lord spoke to me about the first person. And he told me that we were going to be witnessing to Russians who came, who were going to come down and hear you show up, the Russians. And the message to you is, you're not supposed to think about it. This is a message ordained by God. And he sent me here to tell you this. Now, I don't, anybody know, let's see, what time is it? 9.09. You want me to stop or keep going? Keep going, man. Let's right. go. Now, You're doing great. Love five, days, five days before Christmas, Jesus speaks to me and says, I want you to pack your bags. You're leaving for people in dire straits. And I heard this and I, I told Terry, I said, Terry, the Lord told me I need to pack my bags. He's got people that are, are in need of me. And she didn't even question it. Didn't even question it because she's seen so many different things taking place. And she goes, well, where are you going? I said, I don't know. He didn't tell me. She said, come on, Frank. He, he tells you to pack your bags. You don't know where you're going. I said, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> so she said, well, look it. Why don't you take presents with you in case you happen to go north? And if you're close to Adam, you can, you, you know, we don't have to mail the packages. Um. I'm going to hold off for, give me one minute. And the reason why I need this break is because today I was in urgent care. I've been bleeding for five days and I really need to visit the little boy's room for a second so I can finish this. I'll be right back. Go for it. It's all good. Hey guys, how, how, you, uh, how you all doing? You guys staying up? Man, What's up, dude? bro? It's bringing some stuff back to me that I haven't thought about in a while. I, I think I, I, I mean, I, I remember being a kid and uh, hearing these stories and um, it's interesting just recently, so, sometimes we can, we can quench the Holy Spirit, you know, and God doesn't speak to everybody. He speaks to everybody and he speaks to all of us through his word, different ways. And I, I think that I don't, I don't want to use the word I think, but. God has a special relationship with each individual and it's just, are we paying attention to him? And, uh, so this is, this is some really good stuff. Uh, as you were saying, Yosef. Oh, no, I think, I think we should all, um, like one day, instead of doing another, uh, like a Bible study, I think we should all share our stories and testimonies, like for one day, like all of our conversion stories, like in a condensed form, of course, like it would be impossible to tell all of it, but like, you know, in like a condensed form, like yeah, go around def, do that def, definitely frank you want to get a cup of coffee or something are you good no no i'm fine okay yeah it's um, uh, real just, encouraging mark yeah so look uh, at all right so i get in the car the next morning i got my bags packed i got the i got the christmas present with me just in case i don't know where i'm going so i'm sitting in the car just asking the lord okay now where do i go i got nothing the only thing that came into my mind is the words, if you go north, and since I didn't have a direction, I decided to go north. So I get on 101 and I'm driving about 45 minutes into the drive, not knowing where I was going. Jesus spoke to me and told me, you need to call Adam because you have to go on his job because there's people on that job in dire straits that you have to talk to. So I called Adam and I said, Adam, I, the Lord spoke to me and he told me to come up and there's people on your, in your, you know, Adam has a garage door business and I need to go on those jobs. So Adam says, dad, it's been really slow. I haven't had a job in over a month, no phone calls, nothing. But if you want to come up, you're, you know, I'd love to have you to come up. So I said, well, I'm driving. I'll be there. So I'm driving. Of course, when Adam comes on, I don't think he'd be here, be here tonight. Otherwise, he'd already be here. But I'm sure he'll be here some other time. You can ask him about this. About a half an hour later, Adam calls me up. He says, Dad, right after you hung up, my phone started to ring, and I'm booked tomorrow. 
So whatever the Lord told you, it's I'm booked. That's all I can tell you. So I got up there. That was a, a Wednesday. And so on Thursday, I went the first job we go to, there is a, um, Adam would go up and look at the garage door, talk to the owner, and then start working on the, the garage door. And I would be left alone with, with the owner. And the first one, uh, I started to talk to the, to the woman. She was a uh, Oriental woman. And she told me that she had just lost her husband after 50 years of marriage, and she was devastated over it. So I had a chance to speak to her about Jesus and, you know, comfort her. And I, now I had my book with me because Jesus told me, I want you to take these books with you. You're going to hand them out. And she really received it. She was comforted by what we did. And Adam now says, dad, you know, I got a lot of work to do and you can't spend this much time or we'll never get it all done. And I said, I'm just doing what the Lord told me to do, Adam. So we go to the next one. Now, the next one, this is the cleanest garage I've ever seen in my life. There's not a thing in it except two chairs next to the door that leads into the house from the garage. So I, Adam talks to this lady um, and or talked to the guy. And then I walked in and I sat down on the, on the chair and, you know, I didn't have a chance to talk to the guy. But as Adam started to do the work, this guy sits down right next to me and I looked at him and I said, how are you doing? And he said, not good at all. I just got a phone call from my doctor who told me I have lung cancer. And I, right away, I knew this is, this is number two. So I started to talk to him about Jesus Christ. Adam is listening to everything that I'm saying to him. And I told the guy, because the Lord is feeding me information. I said, do you know Hello? Start with no. All right. Well, that's good. He'll be back on, I'm sure. It, it's all good. I guess, you know, he probably pushed a button that he shouldn't have pushed. We all do that. <laughs> Give him hey, a call, Mark. Hey, we should mess with him say, hey, does the rapture come? I repeat. Speaking of pushing buttons, speaking of pushing buttons, you know I'm good at pushing buttons. <laughs> That's that's your gift. The the the, the 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 Hebrew word for ags is gift is, is buttons. Um, let me see. He'll pop back on right now. Let's see. This is quite the story. So let's see where he's at. He should just be popping up. Okay, I'll just wait for that. But anyways, on another note, while well, he's trying to cliff back in um i do i do want to warn you guys too at the same time I, I like to keep it real we always want to be very careful of when people say god told me you know for me at least i get really turned off from it you know um you know but at the same time when when god's speaking to you and you're in your and you're staying close to him he's gonna it's not gonna come back void if it's god you know, anybody else out there? There he is. There's Frankie baby. Frankie baby. Frankie. Frank. Hello. Hello. It said, it said he's connecting. It said connect an audio. Can you hear me? There he is. We hear you. You're good. Can you hear me? We hear you. Okay. All right. My the computer went off and it figures Satan doesn't want you guys to hear this message. No, what happened, Frank, was the rapture came and God told me to tell you something. I'm playing. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just joking. Go ahead. So anyway, the, the gentleman, uh, the Lord spoke to me and he said that, "Do you know what your kids and your wife have been praying for? Your daughters." He goes, "How do you know I have?" daughters i said well i can't explain it to but when jesus speaks to me you just these are the things that take place because he knows everybody and i said do you know what they've been praying for he says your your family have been praying that you would receive jesus christ as the lord person savior you haven't done it yet and he is 
crying. He's got tears dropping down. And he said, you know, Christmas is right around the corner and I haven't done anything. And I, I told him, I said this, I said, look at the best gift that you can give your family because the gift that they've been praying for has nothing to do with money. It has to do with your salvation. The best gift that you can give to him is tell him that you accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, where you do it. And he said, yes. And so after we talked to him, I gave him the book. He was just pumped up. And on the way out, Adam looked at me and said, dad, I apologize. Do you take as much time as you want wherever we're going to go from here on in? So the next, the next, the, uh, appointment we went to was there was a, <clears throat> a lady came out same thing Adam looks at the garage she goes in the she goes in the house but before she went into the house she looked at me and she says well what do you do and I says well I'm Adam's dad I'm a writer and that's all I told her and she went in the house Adam finished the job we were walking towards the truck after he was paid and just before we got to the truck the lady said wait a minute so we both turned around and she looked at me and she says, you didn't tell me what you write about. Just out of nowhere like that. And Adam could be my witness to this. So I said, wait a minute, I want to show you. So I went to the car. I took my book and I hand her the book. I said, this is a book about Jesus Christ. And what if I told you that Jesus Christ personally sent me from Santa Barbara to come to talk to you about salvation? And she starts to bawl crying and adam says you know dad i mean I, but she goes no no it's okay no you don't you don't have you don't understand she goes i've been watching the news for the past two weeks and there, i know there was something something wrong something's not right and so it's really upset so i called my friend and my friend told me that last night jesus spoke to her and said that i am sending you a prophet to tell you about jesus and I, I looked when she said that, and Adam looked at me, and I, I said, and she goes, it's you. And I told her, I said, look, it, I have never called myself a prophet, but if the Lord has revealed to you about this, this is between you and Jesus. And so we hugged, and we prayed, and it was just a glorious time, and, you know, we left. And as we're driving Obviously, I gave her the book and we're driving and Adam, we're talking about all these things. Jesus again speaks to me and he said, you're going north. You have to call Linda, which is Terry's, my wife's sister. You're going to have to go up and talk to her. And so I got on the phone and I called Linda. Now it's uh, tomorrow is Friday. And I said, Linda, I'd like to come up and visit you. I'm, I'm with Adam here at the Bay Area. I'd like to come up and visit you. She goes, oh, I'd love that, Frank. Where's a Christmas parade tomorrow? Would you come with me? My husband doesn't want to go with me. And I said, yeah, I will. She goes, well, tomorrow I have to go to San Francisco. I need that. I got a doctor's appointment. And then I'll be at the cabin at 5 o'clock and we'll go to the parade. And I said, fine, I'll meet you at 5. Adam called back to Linda and said, can, can I come? And, of course, she said, yes. So we both went up there five o'clock we knocked on the door she came out and of course ot her husband he's you know he's i've witnessed to him many times before it just didn't take but this time when i knocked on the door he said you guys got to come in here I, I want you to see this video it, it will blow your mind and i told ot i said i have to go i promised your wife i was going to go to the christmas parade and i'm going to go and adam said i'll i'll go with you ot and it turned out that the disc that he had been watching was a disc about the last days. And he was really, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was incredible because a lot of the things I had already told him, now he's watching on this disc. This is what I found out later. But anyway, I went with Linda to this parade. And on the way, Jesus spoke to me and said, just ask her this question. If you were to die today, what would happen to you? And I asked her, and she said, Frank, I'm a good person. I never hurt anybody. You know the story that we have heard so many times before. And the Lord said, that's it. Don't say anything else. We go to the parade. We had a great time. We come back, sitting at the kitchen table. 
she is on the right hand side i'm on the left hand side and the phone is between us and we're sitting at the counter and the phone rings it's her doctor and i'm listening to this conversation and the doctor says linda you have massive colon cancer and we got to go to surgery right away and i just i just looked and i said oh my gosh i had no idea that one of the people were going to be terry's sister and so she went the the following thursday i believe it was and she had surgery and they took six to eight inches of her colon out and then she had to start this chemotherapy and radiation all of, you know the stuff that they normally do and three months had passed and the family got together up at the cabin from different parts of of uh, the united states just to be close to her and encourage her and the lord said to me again i want you to ask her the same questions that you asked three months previous so i asked her i said linda if something were to happen to you if you were dying today what would happen she goes out frank i told you i'm a good person i'm not i never hurt anybody and the lord said that's it now three months we we all left three months later colon cancer spreads into her liver and most of you know what happens when that happens your history and so the family comes together this was the last time we knew that we were going to be together her eyes were yellow this is what happens when you have liver cancer because i remember this from my mother who died of liver cancer when i was eight years old and the whole family's there i was at the kitchen table with the kids linda was laying on the couch and her girlfriend from next door neighbor came over to me and she said linda is requesting you to come and pray for her because she's in pain so i walked over to where linda was and i kneeled down and i said linda do you remember what i asked you what would happen and she she actually stopped me she said frank and i said yeah i said i interrupted linda are you ready and she said yes and i bawled because i knew what that meant i bawled i couldn't speak i just buried my head into her lap and and her next door neighbor kathy said can i lead her to jesus and i and i couldn't even talk and i said yeah and so she led her to jesus christ in the atmosphere in the house completely changed and after we had prayed for her her neighbor took me outside and she said, I need to tell you something. I had been praying for months that I would be able to lead her to Christ. And I just thought to myself, how gracious is God that he brought me up here to the point where I put the water and I nourished it. And then she came in and finished the deal to receive Jesus Christ as a personal savior. And everything had changed after that. And it wasn't long after that where linda passed away and then this will be the last story because i folks i have so many stories that you probably wouldn't even believe but a year passed and terry's mom has a surprise birthday party in ohio and that sunday the half the family was going to go to the brethren church and the other half was going to be going to the catholic church and i went to the brethren church with half of the family in this particular church, there's the people were sitting so that they were facing each other. Half of them were on this side and half from the other side. And there was a row, nothing in the middle. And then the pastor had the microphone up there in the front. And he came out and he said, after the service last week, I went home to begin to pray. What am I going to talk about next week? I got no message. He said, Monday morning, I got up like I normally do and I start to pray. What am I going to speak about? I got nothing. And I did this Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And this morning, when I got up, I asked the Lord, what am I going to talk about? And he said to me, all I want you to do is say this. Whoever has been blessed, stand up. And so I'm sitting in the front row looking at the people on the other side nobody raised their hand i turn around to look at the people behind me and there was nobody that raised their hand and jesus said stand up you're you're preaching today so i stood up and i walked over to the mic and i told them the story 
that I just told you. And the, the congregation is crying. I mean, just bawling. And the message really touched so many people in that, in that church to the point that even after I left, some of those people made contact with me after I left. So you never know how God is going to work in your life. You just don't know. But the most important part that somebody would want to take advantage of is if the Lord speaks to you, why question it? Don't question it. Just do it. Because with our faith in Christ, who's in us, he's already in us. All we have to do is activate it. And the way you activate it is to open your mouth in obedience to do exactly what he said. And if you listen to his voice and you may think, well, that's me talking in my head. And uh, that's not the Holy Spirit. Trust me, if you take action, even though the Lord doesn't speak because of your faith, that he would do this, he's going to step in and he's going to fulfill exactly what he wants to do in that person. You, you'll never know. The, and the last story is this, really quick story. Every day I'm walking, driving back and forth to work on a bus, 40 minute ride, up and back every day. I sit on the front of the bus, anybody who sat down next to me, they are going to get witness to. That's, that's the job that I'm, I was sent to do. There's one day this gothic girl came in. She was about 24, 25 years old, all in black, black lipstick, black fingernails, black clothes, everything black. She was very pale. I start witnessing to her and she starts laughing at me. And normally I'll listen to what Jesus has to say, but this time I, I didn't have any time. He flushed it out of me. And I told her, I said, because you were laughing at Jesus Christ, he wants you to know that he is real and to know that we are going to have an earthquake right now and as soon as i said that in santa barbara california sitting at the red light on this bus the bus starts to rock back and forth we had an earthquake the girl stood up and she started to scream looking at me and i thought she was going to pass out i thought she was pale before but when i said that and we we're rocking it scared the living hell out of her she yelled at the bus driver to get me off the bus. And he, he looked, he went back to look at me, looked at her open, and we both watched her run down the road. Five years later, the bus driver found me. Now I left Santa Barbara and I got a new route in Goleta. So I didn't have to ride the bus anymore. But this guy, five years later comes up and he says, I've been looking for you. Do you remember who I am? And he, he caught me at the last five houses of my delivery. And I looked at him and I said, well, sort of. He goes, you used to sit on my bus. You remember now? And I said, yes, I do. He goes, I remember what you said. I remember what you did on that bus. And I want to tell you right now, because of what you did, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And the reason why I needed to find you is because I am dying and I'm going to be home with Jesus soon. And I wanted you to know where I was going because of what you did. So you never know who it is that you're going to be witnessing to. Just like the guy, the fisherman on the bus or on the, on the uh, pier where I thought I was witnessing. And it was a younger kid. Come to find out there was two bus drivers that received Jesus because of what I did. And if I didn't speak. If I didn't have the faith to speak, who knows what had happened? But if you're destined to reach out to, to meet certain people in your life, you don't want to miss the joy and the opportunity of fulfilling what Jesus Christ said. So for now, like I said, I can go on and on, but I know it's late and that'll be it. So I hope this story builds your faith up. And just so that you know that you can do anything that you want in Jesus Christ, you have more power in you than you can imagine. Greater is in you than he that is in the world. Never forget that. Hey Amen. Thank you so much, Frank. I, I, every time I hear it, it gets better. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, 
I remember when I first heard this, I remember, remember when we were at the Lompoc Vineyard, we did a little conference yeah. at the vineyard. And I remember hearing this and you were going over the, the RFDI chip, everything yeah. that you showed us in, in clips. I remember that has already basically happened and tapped yeah. me. And yeah. so, and I, and the guy you were saying, who's the guy Comiskey or your best friend, what was his name? The bass player, your best friend. Yeah. Oh, that's John, John Ruskowski. Yeah. I met him through, through, through Adam and oh, you know, okay. he, he's yeah. a real, he's yeah. a real deal, he's man. Second photographer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and just to jump off a little bit, I'm going to let, her, uh, let um, Sly speak next, but it was interesting. Uh, we were doing a little coffee. It just kind of reminded me, Adam and I were doing a little thing at the coffee house in Southside and back in, I think it was like the late nineties. And I remember it was called coffee. Um, I think it was no passion for Jesus. It was called passion for Jesus. It was something we started. We just, just, we just stepped out in faith. We just play a couple songs and just start teaching the word. And I remember one time him and I went there specifically to, to go minister to some people. We didn't know who, but we knew that God wanted us to minister to somebody there. And we go there and we had just white shirts on, nothing, nothing elaborate. We go there. And as we decide, as soon as we walked into the coffee house, somebody was walking towards to get a cup of coffee. They saw Adam and they started pointing at our shirts and they were like, Jesus, Jesus, like what? And they were like, trip it out. Like there was something on our shirts. And, 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 they, and, they, and that person started running away. Like literally ran away as if someone was in a, like attack them. Like literally, like, I mean, it was pretty bad. Like, I don't know. But my point is, is that it's interesting how we, him and I, we would, when we stepped out in faith, I mean, we prayed over people, demons come out and they get saved. And so, yeah. you know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting because I was talking recently about quenching the Holy Spirit because a lot of us have gotten so used to quenching the Holy Spirit and what is God, you know, we want to be biblical. We want to stay biblical. That is right. the key. But Absolutely. the biggest thing is, am I hearing, am I truly hearing God? Am I truly listening? And when you say that you, you hear God, do you hear God? Is it like something you hear in your spirit? Is it something like you, uh, you hear an inner voice or, I'm just curious. Like it's, you, it's, I, you know, it's really hard to explain. All I know is it's in that. It, it's like he's speaking to my head that I know that it's him. There's the just a special voice that when he speaks, you know, you have to act. You know, you have to act. It's just, you know, that you know, that you know. Yeah. And John, the, the guitar player you're talking about. Yeah. And Steve Pelosi, the first guy, the first photographer. Uh -huh. I baptized both of those guys. Mm -hmm. in the ocean at the same time wow you're all <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh bring pictures next time so well, yeah. well you know if i was home i meant to do that because i have a program that you would have been seeing everything that i was speaking about mm -hmm. and i didn't even cover how the book came about and how the book when the lord told me to write one book he was going to do the same thing that he did with the slideshow. And that book made just about every country around the world now, including underground in China. We might have to do a part two because you didn't even do the You didn't do the talk about when you died and, and you could see what oh, everybody no. was. Yeah, yeah no, that's I, my that's my I, favorite part. No, there's so many different <laughs> things. There's, anyway. there's so many different things. So many different things. Yeah. You know, when you when you are active in Jesus, people see it. And they're they are gravid the gravity takes over where they want they want you to do certain things. But you know, only God, when he calls you, you could do these things. That the pastor of uh, Trinity Nazarene, his wife called me and said, Frank, there's a, a lady that is dying. She's in the convalescent home. And they said that she's going to, she probably die tonight. And would you come and pray for her? And I don't even know this lady. And I figure, you know, why not the pastor? But I don't know, question when people ask, you just do it. So I went and I prayed for this lady. And I remember just getting right into her face. And I told her, I said, I want you to look into my eyes. Because when you look into my eyes, 
you're not going to see my eyes. The eyes that you're going to be looking at are Jesus Christ eyes that are in me. And I prayed for her. The next day, Kathy, the pastor's wife, calls. She says, Frank, you'll never believe what happened. I said, what happened? She goes, the lady you prayed for last night, she's in the hallway wheeling herself in a wheelchair down the hallway. I can't explain it. All I know is this is what they asked me to do. And, you know, earlier I told you when the Lord said, keep your pride in check. When when things happen like this and people around you see they want to lift you up, they want to make your head swell. And I, I honestly, guys, I don't allow that. I just tell them, look at if if you're going to be around me, I want you to treat me just like you would treat anybody else. Everybody has a ministry. Everybody's got a certain gift and they're active in those gifts. So please treat me just the way that you would treat me because if you don't then you know i don't want to i don't want to be part of it so you could really a lot of people have been caught you know you watch these tv programs where the guys they're you know dancing on the stage and, and and i really believe this is one of the reasons why jesus told me you're not to do that just talk to the people the way you talk to the people i'm going to do the rest that's why for the rest that's why Frank, when, you, when you and I go out to eat, I always make sure you pay. That's why I don't treat you. <laughs> Remember that, okay? So when I'm back in Lompoc, I'm, I think I'm yeah. going to... Well, I know, I know that... Uh, I don't know who said it because I just came in from the bathroom, but I, I really <laughs> believe that there are other stories from other people who have things like this are happening to them, but it's not spoken. People don't know about it. And I think... It's a great idea. It's our witness to other people, how God is demonstrated in all of our lives, how he's acted in our lives. I, I agree. And so what we'll do is let's keep it between. I know I say three to five minutes, but I'm looking at our time because I want to be uh, I know we go. I know we all have questions. So um, Sly, if we could start with you. Oh, no, you did great, Frank. You did, that was awesome. Sly, starting with you, my friend, if you can unmute, that'd be great. Maybe you're frozen. I don't know. Is that a pose? <laughs> I'll go to the when, when that. Okay, I guess something's going on there. Um, let's see. Mr. Walter Walter Flores. Can you un ask to unmute Mr. Walter Flores? Dad, it's all you. Sorry, had some difficulty there. <laughs> yeah um thank you very much for that frank um it's uh always uh appreciative to hear you uh speak um to us about your testimony and and how god speaks to you um uh, as a matter of fact uh, when i teach in john <coughs> after thir 14 yet <laughs> Um, I'm going to be touching on that. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can, we can get an understanding of, of how God speaks to us and, um, we'll, we'll touch, I'm going to touch on some scripture about, you know, the dwelling place of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. And, um, and that's what we'll be covering in John, uh, 14, uh, next week. Um. It's it's pretty interesting um, how when God speaks to us, well, for the most part, uh, we we don't know what God what God's will is. Okay, um, for the most part, He said He will put His Spirit in us, mm -hmm. and that the Spirit is going to guide us into all things. Right. You know, when you when you go to the store, you didn't take Jesus. Took he you. took you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, just just imagine that. Okay. Yeah. We we oh, think boy. we think we're taking Jesus somewhere. Um no. It, his he is capable. His spirit is so powerful. Yeah. 
and he is capable of uh, accomplishing his will in us. We don't know what we're doing uh, for the most part. And, and, you know, in my recollection, God is not going to say, well, what's, what should I do, Lord? He's not going to come out and say, hey, drive down the street at the stop sign, make a right, and then go left. He, he's not going to come out and tell you that. Wherever you're at, that's what Christ is doing with you. Wherever you, I mean, sure, yeah, you ask God, you know, you pray constantly and you ask God, you know, for guidance and he's going to guide you. His spirit will guide you. And you still don't know what, where he wants you to be, but could, because wherever you're at, whatever you're doing right now, at this very minute, that's where God wants you. Wants you. Wherever you ended up in life, you know, um, and I, I do believe that he speaks to us through, uh, uh, excuse me, hold on a second. Some, my wife turned up the TV and left. Um, <laughs> you know, um, whatever we're doing in life, see, God has already, he's the alpha and the omega. He's already been in our tomorrow. He already knows what we ask. The scriptures say he already knows what we're going to ask before, even before we ask it, because he's already right. been there. It's yeah. up to us actually to figure out what he's doing at the moment, what he's doing with us. Um, and a lot of people, you know, they scramble around trying to figure out what God's will is. Well, if nothing's happening at the moment, that's your answer. <laughs> you know, and, and, yeah. it, and it works both ways. Uh, and then when you pray and sometimes things happen right away. Right. You know, he's the one that's, that's guiding us into everything that he wants us to do. Everything, every single thing, every incident that comes our way, every, you know, phrase, whether it be praising, uh, a praiseful event, whether it be a trial. Um, so, you know, whenever, whenever we encounter such things, I myself would have to pull back and say, okay, God, what are you telling me? What are you trying to teach me? Because he's always trying to teach us something. Everything that happens to us on this earth, God is preparing us for eternity. That's right. right, 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 right. You know, you know um, he, he, is, he is preparing us for eternity and the life that we are living on this earth is all a preparation. You know, I, I used to live my life uh, growing up thinking, um, you know, survival of the fittest. Um, we, we have to do everything in our power to, to, you know, live the big dream, live in the dream, as they would say. And it took me so many years to finally realize, that, hey, we're just here on this world temporarily. We are but tent dwellers here. And I came to the realization that nothing in the universe matters to me anymore but God's word. Amen. And you know what? Thank God the entire Bible is prophecy. It's all prophetic. To me, you know, back in the Old Testament, prophecy came by God speaking to a man audibly and half the time those prophets didn't understand <laughs> the prophecy given to them yeah right they said oh yeah this is going to be a messiah he's going to come and and you know uh he, he's he's going to rule the world and all that but they didn't understand it was going to be jesus they just knew that in the future uh, uh god's son will show up as the messiah um, and so that was God giving his word to man audibly 
And then uh, when Christ came and the apostles came and, and they wrote these things down, it became the Bible. Well, prophecy became the word. So now the word of God is telling me, speaking to me audibly. As we read God's word, we understand who he is. And, you know, all seek you first king of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Um, everything in life will be added unto you. But the main thing is to understand his word. Amen. And when we understand his word, he unlocks the mysteries in life. I mean, we might not understand it all at the time, but at in, in any given time, he, he lights that light bulb up on your head and he's going to ring a bell and, and you're going to remember, oh, that's what he meant by that scripture. And it just blows you away. So, yeah, I'll be talking on that um, next week. Um, so be, tuned, be in tune, guys. Um, read up on uh, chapter 14 of John. And uh, uh, thanks again, Frank, for, for speaking to us. And we really appreciate it. That's my honor. All right. Uncle, Uncle Pete, number one Raiders, Raider Nation. Okay, we don't hear you. Let's see. Now we hear you. There you are. Hey, hey, Frank, if God speaks to you about me, man, don't hesitate to call me. <laughs> you know, I've heard that many times before. <laughs> oh. Hey, hey, Frank, you're like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, thanks. thanks so much for sharing. It, it's, it's uh, uh, um, I, I can feel the spirit. And, um, but I, I, I do, you know, there's a lot of people that, um, they, they, they come and they say, you know, God told me so. And, and, and Mark had hit it right on the head. You, you, you got to be careful in that. I, I, I truly believe that God speaks to you, Frank. Uh, but there are a lot of people who has come to me, and I know them personally. Um, and they tell me that God spoke to me. And, and in my heart, I didn't feel the spirit. And I, and I just knew that that individual wanted to uh, justify their actions and right. using God to, to do so. Um, but that's on them, you know, and, yeah, and, right. and, and, and what you're telling me is that God spoke to you about uh, other people and these things came to pass. No doubt about it. Yeah. See, and, and a lot of people look for that con confirmation. Um, and, and it's, 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 I mean, it, it, my heart just tells me, Hey, you know, uh, the confirmation is instantaneous most of the time with you. Just like the earthquake, you know, um, and, and and I really do appreciate you sharing, and, and I can't wait for you to share more. Yeah, I there's like I said, I do. Somebody told me that I should, you know, write a book about all these different things, but Jesus told me flat out when he gave me the uh, instructions in 1977 that you were going to write one book, and one book only, and you never to charge anybody for that book, and. Uh, it, it came a time where I'll, I'll save that for another time because it, it's very, very important that that one book got in the hands of one pastor in uh, Eldorado, Kenya. And from that one pastor, my ministry blew up. I had 15 pastors in Africa and then we went to Sudan and Nairobi and we went into uh, different uh, Pakistan and India and Haiti. And I mean, it, it's just all over the place. And I, you know, it's Jesus. He wanted mm -hmm. this to go out and he's the one that made it possible to get these books in the hands of those people in the ministries of uh, jail ministries in Africa, releasing prisoners because they didn't have money. I mean, the Lord just didn't put me in a ministry of of prophecy he put me in a ministry of winning the souls he put me in the ministry of helping people to feed people to give them medicine all for free shoes mosquito nets uh it just goes on and on and on and i am so privileged to be able 
to say that Jesus called me to do this. I mean, how, you know, over the course of these years, I've had all kinds of people, including my son, see, you know, why is it that, you know, 45 years, you never stop? I said, look, at if something like this happened to you, how would you, how could you stop? I mean, there's no way when you see all these things taking place, there's no way you can stop. You, you, you just have to go forward. And I don't want it to stop. I want to be, I want to be the Holy Spirit filled guy who's not afraid to go out and to talk to somebody. So it's, if the Lord speaks to you, just pay attention. And just so that your pride doesn't get in the way and you want something as an outcome to take place because when you do that, you're not, you're speaking from yourself and nothing is going to come of it. So I, you know, I wish I could tell everybody, Hey, this is, this is the method, how it happens, how he speaks to you. I can't do that. All I know is when the Lord speaks to me, I have to act. And when you act, at least in my life, I see the results of it. Hmm. So, so, so more of him and less of us. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, if you trust Jesus, why are you afraid to say anything? If you go to the Bible study every single week and then you're confronted with somebody and you hold back, why? Why is it? Fear? It's not from God. It's fear from Satan. He doesn't want mm. you to stand up for what Jesus has given to you in his word. He doesn't want you to believe that. Jesus is the one who said, trust me. Trust me. You know, he gave Abraham, have faith. Look what he did. He blessed him. If we do that, we take the step out, and he's going to bless us. Amen. I'm just fortunate that I can share the, the stories. But like I said, there are a lot of other people who have the same types of stories, and I'd love to hear those. Me too. Oh, awesome. We have Ramon Basera. <laughs> I'm working on my accent. Masara. <laughs> so uh, I just want to say thank you, Josh, for sharing your story. Um, I've been um, serving the Lord my whole life, but my faith has been the strongest ever since I've met Mark. I feel like Mark has kind of been a guardian angel of me, getting me back into the word of God. And um, ever since I've met Mark, uh, about a month and a half, two months ago, um, there's been a shift in my life. Um, I can't every single day, I have to share the word of God with somebody. One per, if someone talks to me for five, 10 minutes, they're going to get the wrath. They're going to let them know <laughs> oh that, um, that I follow God. The and, wrath. Uh, everyone, <laughs> everyone, I, I speak to someone every day about the, the word of the word of God. And, um, yeah. and, uh, I don't preach i just tell them what's happening in my life how how i feel so much peace love and happiness right now and and when i was hearing your your story they're like these little miracle stories and i'm noticing in my life there's a shift in my life something is happening that i've never felt before it's not this feeling like it seems like things are coincident coincidentally happening in the right direction and the direction I've always wanted to move it in. And, um, and my, um, you know, what, what, what happened with me is, uh, you know, my poison is, um, is money and women. And so uh, I decided that, you know, I mean, that I'm not going to chase women and I'm not going to chase money. And uh, those are the things that kind of like, like if I ever was messed up right here is because of that. You know, um, in the past 20 years, uh, I've been chasing money. I've been in sales and I work six, seven days a week, you know, 10 to 12 hours a day. I'm working all day, every day. And I push my whole family away. Mm -hmm. And um, ever since I met Mark, it's not that I stopped working. It's just I decided not to chase it. And right now in my life, the money is chasing me. Um, I'm having a lot of abundance in my life. And, and I tell Mark this story all the time. And I tell him, he told me what's going to happen. Cause when I first started telling him, like I was telling him that, you know, I'm kind of financially struggling and I'm not today. And he told me when you start getting your blessings, like he was telling me when you start getting your blessings, 
You need to keep the cross closer to you. And I'll never forget that. Yeah. Because yeah. everyone yeah. reaches out to God when things are going great. Yeah. Or going bad, excuse me. They're like, please, I need your help. Right. And I just noticing, like, just like how you said, Frank, like, every time something happens, I feel like it's a test. Like, like um, I'm trying to like, there's a learning lesson in every little thing I'm doing. And so um, um, these little things that were happening into your life, they're happening in my life right now too, in a very powerful way. And uh, it's not coincidence that Mark came into my life and now I feel there's a certain way. And now these blessings are happening and it's because of the power of the Lord. It has to be. No, Who else can it be? I, you know, I, I, when it when when you make a change in your life, things should happen in a positive direction if you're if you're doing positive things and um, and I really believe that because it, you know I'm a I'm a diet coach. I help people lose body fat, and until they make that change and create that habit, um, it, nothing is ever going to change. And so, for you, these things like. To you, Frank, it's like, man, all these things are happening to you. Like, I can't believe it. Like, I'm not a prophet. Like, I'm not this guy. Like, me too. Like, I'm not, like, literally a month and a half ago, I was not speaking about the word of God to anybody. <laughs> you know, nobody. Like, that was not me. And uh, these the small little miracles are happening to you, and they're happening to me. And, like, I don't know why it's happening to me, but I really feel like uh, it's my time. And so I think it's because uh, I'm trusting in him. I'm trusting in God that he's, that uh, I'm doing the right thing. And I think when you start doing the right thing and everything, um, I think that's when things start happening. So I think these miracles, are, I call them like little small miracles. I'm getting a lot of that too, Frank. And I don't, and I'm just letting it happen. And, um, and I tell everyone every single day, um, how I follow the Lord, how I'm faithful to my woman, how I'm good to my woman. And I just have so much happiness right now that I want everyone to get a little piece of that. I want everyone to be happy. And if you, you can't do it without serving the Lord and being good with your family, yeah. everything else that's happening in my life, I know it's, it's just like trials and tribulations of, of just going, just stepping out the door. Um, but I think the most important thing for me is uh, like, like, for example, last week, I had an appointment at six on Wednesday. I'm like, Ugh, here's my challenge. And I didn't go to that appointment because I have Bible study on Wednesdays at six o'clock. And I know how important that is to me to stay grounded. And, uh, you know, as long as I give the Lord a little time every single day, I think I'm going to get the blessing. So I think that's what happened with you, uh, Frank. I think all these little weird things about this like, obsession, like these OCDs and throwing this crap inside the dresser. Like, you don't know why the hell you're doing it. Like things are like happening. Like to me, I don't know why I'm doing these things, but these blessings are happening. And I want to tell you one blessing that's happening right now in my life. So I'm in this transition of going, of, of going from selling insurance to uh, selling solar. And um, it was a big decision because you're so used to doing this one job every single day. And I made the decision and literally in one week, I got like 30, 40 people coming to this event to start selling solar for, for me and my organization. I haven't even, I've only been here one week and I'm being blessed by the Lord because I feel like it's my time. And um, so I sent a message to Mark today. I say, hey man, help me with my speech because I'm going to be running, I'm going to, me and two other people are going to be running this, uh, this meeting and I'm super excited about it because uh, I haven't ran a sales meeting in, I don't know, like five, six years. So I'm really excited about it because I feel like uh, um, I'm going to tell people in that room the story about how the Lord changed my life. Yeah. I don't care about if it's a sales meeting. I'm going to tell them how it changed my life and what's happening in my life. And if, what a great way to share the word of God is to 30, 40 people. I don't even know. They're going to get it. If you're going to talk to me for five minutes, you're going to get the wrath. So uh, that's all I got to say, guys, man. Blessings are happening around. I'm really happy. And um, I'm really fortunate to have this group because uh, uh this is one of the most important things in my life right now it's very small to some people but it's huge to me so thanks for listening guys and don't forget the love of the lord yes don't forget when you're talking to him I, and uh i'm gonna remember that because uh 
you know, why is he blessing me? I don't know. But thanks for reminding me of that because it's the love that he has for me. So thank you, Frank. Well, Mark, uh, just so everybody knows, um, my book you can get for free. It's online in my, in my, uh, in my posts. And I do make the videos of what's going on. I think part of the reason why people like yourself are saying they're being blessed, you don't know what's going on right now. I believe that the Lord is looking for those people in the last days who are going to be the soldiers of Christ on the front line. Because we're marching very, very rapidly to the beginning of the tribulation period without a question. I wrote a post today about the convergence and for the first time in the history of man, all of those signs that Jesus talked about are taking place in one single generation. And there's no, there's no way around it, especially when Jesus said, this, is, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So it's, it's not a coincidence that all these things are happening. It's not a coincidence that the Lord is choosing certain people. Our He's generation. choosing the people who are saying yes. Mm. The, not a maybe, but yes, I, I'm, you're being called and you're ready to go. The armor is on, you're ready to go. Amen. Amen. Um, let's see. You're trying to stay awake, Mark, or what? What's going on? <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to look for my cup of coffee. I can't find it. Um, <laughs> hey, Miles, you're up, my friend. I think half the guys fell asleep. Hey, it's all good. We don't really end at five, but you know what? It's all good. Let's. Uh... No, I'm I'm working it out. I had to I had to figure out the unmute thing. <laughs> I had a I had a couple questions for you, Frank. Sure. Um, what year were was it that you wound up with uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses? It was 1970 at the latter part of 1976. When the Lord put me in ministry. Yeah, the Lord put me in a ministry in 1977, the beginning of it. So that was 11 months, right? Is that what yeah. you said? Yes, 11 months I studied with him. And then your, uh, your YouTube, I, I found too, um, I found the Unbelievable, and that's that seems to be like a, like, a, like a podcast kind of thing. And then there was another one that was like past or end times revelation or something like that. Is that, did I find the right thing to follow you at? I can put it in here and I can put it in the uh, stream right now. Oh, nice. Nice. Um, okay. I'll make it simple. I actually, have, <clears throat> I got the YouTube channel and the end times research ministry channel. That's the one. Yeah. That's, that's the prophecy site. And then the other one's the uh, Bible prophecy man site. Um, you know, different people like the different formats so they can go wherever they want. But every time I make a video, it's placed on both of those sites. Okay. Outstanding. Yeah. That is awesome. No, I agree with you 100, 110% that something is definitely happening. Um, I, I just recently converted um, in 2020. And, you know, I, I started to write a, 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 like a book almost. Started off as a testimony and then it started, you know, and it be, just became things. And I was rediscovering things in my past where God had worked on me without me even realizing it because I had no idea, um, you know, and, and things are happening. You know, I, I believe this group is, a, is, is on purpose. I don't believe in coincidences anymore. I don't think they exist. I, I think everything happens and every story that we read in the Bible, you know, like um, I, I liked, I love Genesis. Um, the Genesis fanatic. I, I love that book. It's the best, best book. Right. Um, you know, and, and you see how things are placed and it, it looks so bleak and it looks very grim, but then all of those things end up working out. We're placed in, in a trial or, or a situation, be it negative, and, and it always seems to work out for the best it always seems to you know you may be placed over here so you can have an impact on somebody else over here um and then they have an impact over here and and so on and you know it's just amazing and hearing your testimony it was just it was awesome you did a great job great great job 
I appreciate the, you know, I appreciate that. I, I love telling the story how Jesus worked. And uh, over the years, it, it has made a big impact. I don't know how many people I'll see in heaven that I touched, but um, I'm joyful knowing that I had a part in the kingdom. That's, yeah. that's just the way it is. I, I'm grateful to Jesus for, I don't, I, you know, just about every single day I say, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to do this work and uh, being backed up by the, the most powerful source in the universe. You can't go wrong when you say yes to Christ, that's for sure. And it and funny funny story was the uh the whole topic of our uh of our sermon tonight, you know, when I was at church, because I go from church right to here and I'm mm -hmm. in Ohio, so it's uh, I don't know, quarter after eleven now. Um Yeah, I'm in Texas right now. I live in California, but I'm in Texas, so yeah. But it was it was listening and obeying God, are you listening? Was right. the the title of this sermon. And it was just, it's so funny that you come over here and, and you get, we get these stories about how you just listened. Yeah. Well, I wasn't and supposed so to speak tonight. I wasn't supposed to speak. Yeah. Mark asked me tonight to step in and because yep. I was going to go home and prepare so that you could see everything that I was talking about. But this is what the Lord wanted tonight. So, you, you know, it's his choice. It's, so, and that's, and that's one of those coincidences yeah. that I don't believe in. Nothing coincidence, <laughs> right. So You're absolutely right. I don't believe in coincidence. It's amazing. I don't believe it. So yeah, if, if, if you're trying to witness to people, the first place, the Bible is always the first place we should be. But sure. if you want to witness to people to show them how close we are to, you know, Jesus coming back, if you can find another book that has more information than my book that you can get for free, I want to know about it. <laughs> I, I have it. to get that book. There, there have been many, many, people, many people around the world who told me they come to listen to what I have to say because they know I can, they can trust me because I'm not asking a dime from them. Yeah. You know, wow. God is rich. Oh, it's why, do powerful. Charge, why do I have to charge people? Uh, <laughs> oh, well, we have TJ in the house. Go ahead, TJ. You're up next, my friend. Okay. He's sleeping. He's, uh, he's sleeping. <laughs> he's using the restroom. Okay, there we go. I'm here. All right. Um, sorry, man. I was just at Walmart checking out real quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, Frank, listening to your story, man, I'll tell you what. Um, I'm one of those people that, that I feel God speaks to me all the time. And I think... Uh, I mean, look at us, look at all of us here in this room. You know, I think we're all here in this room brought together as warriors of Christ because we're all people that God talks to in, a, in his own way. You know, like Mark said, um, the Lord does speak to us all. And I, I know that he touches each one of us in a way that he has prescribed beforehand for us to know him, you know? And um, uh, when I, you know, I, I won't, I won't launch into my story, you know, because my story is just about as long as yours. <laughs> Um, but when God first started teaching me about the Bible, he used Marvel comics, <laughs> like no kidding, man. He used Marvel comics and, and star Wars. And, and he taught me how those things are parables and, <clears throat> and, um, uh, you know, the, um, it, it's just, and again, it's like, you know, he, he spoke to me through those stories to, to show me that, you know, uh, Mark 10, 14 being one of the most important, uh, scriptures there is, right. You know, let the little children come to me and hinder them not believe like a child. You know, these stories are made for children, but they're parables about, about the things that happen in the Bible. And it's just incredible the way the Lord speaks to us, man. And, and, um, you know, I've, again, I've had some, some very personal, uh, some very personal, very real encounters with God speaking through me, you know, to, to other people. And, um, couple of things you said stood out the thing about the jehovah witnesses and, and them challenging the elders you know and, and, and then saying how how you said uh you know we don't we don't question the elders the mormon faith is like that too and um i know i've talked briefly about my history with the mormon faith but um my ex-wife was mormon and uh 
Mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about the Mormon church, you know, and I thought, all right, you know, well, I just want to go to church with my wife, you know, so I, you know, I was raised Catholic and, and I've said for years, I need more God in my life. I need more Jesus in my life. And, and, um, and so, uh, you know, I met this woman and we worked together and, and, um, mm-hmm. she was a member of the LDS faith and I didn't know anything about it. I thought, well, how bad can it be? You know, and so uh, I started doing the missionary lessons and learning about about the Mormon faith. And, you know, I got baptized in it and everything. And oh. and um, yeah, and I just like just like you, you know, I was but it, there were things like just like you said, there were things about the Mormon faith that I was going. This just seems hokey, man. This just doesn't seem right. You know, like there's three levels of heaven and every every Mormon church you walk into, it's like all hail Joseph Smith. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah. You know, and uh but they don't, you know, and it's just like you said, like the, the things like, like the polygamy, the polygamy in the Mormon church, you know, the, the Mormon church didn't want to touch on it for years. You know, there was a, a, a piece of the Mormon faith that was deliberately left out of the Mormon teachings about an angel came to Joseph Smith and held him at so- a sword to his face, to his throat and said, God is commanding you to commit polygamy and marry a bunch of women. And if you don't do it, I'm going to kill you, you know, and they leave that out. Like my ex-wife, she didn't even know that existed. She had no idea that story existed. Or so she says, Uh, but the church doesn't teach it. You know, they don't teach it because obviously polygamy is not something that's, that's looked on today, you know, with a lot of favor. And um, so I was, uh, you know, when I first came to the Lord about a, a year ago is when I really started to just, you know, um, I think Brad said, or somebody said how, uh, whoever was just talking before me about, uh, not before miles, like, I'm like that too. If somebody talks to me for five minutes, they're getting the wrath, man. They're getting like, you know, the full on, I am the Jesus freak, the Bible thump of Jesus freak. I never in my life thought I would be this guy, <laughs> you know? And, um, so I started, I just, I watch videos all the time, documentaries, Bible stories, uh, lost secrets of the Bible. You know, I'm just reading, learning everything I can, like a sponge. And so I came across this video and I, and it was a Mormon video and I had no idea it was a Mormon video. It was on YouTube. I did. It just looked neat. It was like called like the, the days of Noah or something like that. And uh, it was about, it, it talked about this guy who was uh, um, lived in the 1800s and about 1844 or 1842 or 43. And uh, he was a Mormon pastor. But again, I missed that part in the whole video. Um, and I realized that me missing that piece of that video was God's doing because God wanted me to see what this video was about. If I had known it was a Mormon video, I would have shut it off. But, but, um, so I'm, I'm watching it. It's talking about this guy, this, this pastor of this Mormon church, uh, back in, in 1842 or 43. And he's, he's like diving into the book of Daniel. This guy was so hell bent that he was going to uncover when the second coming of Christ was based on the prophecies listed in the book of Daniel. right? Right. And so, he goes through and after like about a year and a half, he comes to the conclusion, Jesus Christ, the second coming is going to be in the year 1844. He's like, yeah. hallelujah. Oh my God. I figured could, it out. You could know? you hold that for one second? Yeah. Like, like I said earlier, I'm going to have to take a short minute break because it's like, oh, a, yeah. um, otherwise uh, it, it's I'm all like bleeding all over myself. Just give me one. Yeah, I'll pause it, man. I want you to hear this. So. Frank, you need to keep a bottle with you, brother. Keep a bottle with you. <laughs> nobody, nobody will know. Just don't shake. <laughs> just don't. <laughs> hey, yeah, just don't. Oh, just keep God. it real. Yeah. Just don't do the ending. <laughs> oh my God. You know what? The truth will set you free. I'm sorry. That's horrible, Mark. <laughs> you know what? It is what it is, man. It is yeah, what it is. <laughs> I don't believe I said that. That was awesome. Yep. Stay strong. <laughs> That's funny. I don't, I don't believe I said that. That was awesome. Oh, Lord. Oh, man. That's too much. What's going on, Jason? What up? I tried to. Uh, I didn't even recognize you, man, because of your beard. To be honest with you, I was like, "Is that uh, Jason?" Yeah, uh, I was. I just wanted to come by and say hi, and then uh, I. What, what's his name that was speaking? Frank. Is it Bill? Frank. Frank baby. Frank? Frankie baby. Yeah, he like. I was kind of um, between things, and he really started catching my attention. Uh, yeah, like a lot of the things he says, he it, he like has 
such like a, a faith, like a big faith in Jesus that it, it's just like you can tell in his stories. And I, I would love to have stories like that. Like th they just sound so real and so like 